And I'm delighted to say uh, Grania Walsh, Irish boxer and Tullamore's finest, is on the line, fresh off her victory over Amy Broadhurst at the National Elite Boxing Championships. Grania, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning. I'm good. Uh, yeah, still trying to come down from the high, even though it's, what, five days later. But um, yeah, I'm enjoying my week, uh, kind of basking in the glory of, of last week's win. But um, yeah, looking forward to what's to come as well. I'm not going to get too complacent. It's seven days of rest and then we're back to the grind again. <laughs> so um, talk to us a little bit about it, right? What is the immediate aftermath like of um, of beating somebody like Amy Broadhurst, who's a you know very nationally significant figure in Irish boxing? Um, well, yeah, it, it, I don't know. Twitter kind of blew it up as this massive shock. I don't know. I think I was the only one that wasn't shocked, to be honest. Like, I know my reaction uh, when I heard 3 2 uh, on the night, I was kind of, I, I was confident that I'd won. But when I heard 3 2, and given Amy's name and everything she's won in the last 12 months and with my injury history over the last three years, I was nearly doubting myself. But, um, yeah, unbelievable, like to, to beat the likes of Amy, who's been in unbelievable form. Um, and like I said, with my injury history, I don't think many people were giving me a, a shout at the at the fight. But um, myself, my family and my coach believed in me and I knew I could get over the line if I stuck to the game plan. And I felt like I did that. What does it change for you in terms of what it opens up in possibilities wise over the next while? Yeah, well, these elite championships had a lot at stake in terms of like making a statement um, especially for myself, because had I lost, I don't know what way it would have been back because of the fact that I haven't fought in so long. But um, it doesn't guarantee anything either. It puts me in as the front runner to go to the qualifiers. But like I said, there's no there's no kind of time to rest or or to dwell on this. It's you're only as good as your last performance. So I need to keep performing consistently and still in the gym as well. We're back to the high performance next week and. Uh, There'll be plenty of assessments and loads of sparring to be done to get selected. So I'll be kind of just keeping one foot in front of the other and hoping that I'm I'm on that plane to the European Games this summer. The photographs, Gronje, of that split second when your when your hand is lofted into the air last weekend are are quite incredible because you can see the the pure unfiltered joy on your face and then Amy Amy's in tears and she she leaves the arena then in tears. Like most boxers have experienced both sides of of that spectrum and both mm-hmm. of those emotions. I mean, I guess it puts it in perspective for you because because you've been on both sides of that, you probably experience and appreciate the highs even more. Oh, one hundred percent! Like the the win at the weekend, like was the best feeling. Like I was asking, like God, an Olympic medal must feel something like that. Like that's how significant the win was for me because of how much I've been through. Like in terms of being told that I'm, I have really no hope if anything else happens to my hand because I've had five injuries on the same thumb so um yeah like that's why it just made it all the sweeter for me but like you said every most boxers have been on both sides of three two decisions of tight fights like that and i think the the win was so significant for me but because of amy's form the loss for her as well like it, it is terrible that there has to be a loser but that's just those pictures sum up the kind of highs and lows um, of a split second of an individual sport. You know, if you're in a team sport, you, you share the loss or the win with 10 or whatever, 14 other people. But um, in boxing and in a lot of individual sports, it's completely you for the highs and the lows. I was just lucky that I had so many people there supporting me on the night as well. So to share that moment with them and there was tears from them. I couldn't believe how much it meant to them as well. So uh, yeah, a night I definitely won't be forgetting for a very long time. Have you ever had moments of, of self doubt? You mentioned the thumb. Like to have a recurring thumb injury as a as a boxer must be so, so frustrating. Yeah, it really is. Um the the mental side of it is more frustrating than the physical because like, you know, I think kind of pain goes hand in hand with being in a contact sport. But um the physical side of it, like especially twenty twenty, like I've been injured since January twenty twenty, but the diff- most difficult year was twenty twenty two, even though I did managed to get away to um, a tournament last year. I had two fights over in Romania and won both fights, but I injured my hand in the semi-final, which meant I had to pull out of the final. But I got injured four weeks before the Worlds, so I had to just like watch the whole team head away to the Worlds and you know win big money and uh, and just climb the ladder when I was just sitting at home. And likewise, again, for the, for the Europeans there in October, I broke my hand in the first round of uh, my third assessment and that put me out of the running. So those kind of things and, and a big, a massive part of all that to cope with it for me was coming off social media because I know social media has such an influence today um, 
But like, you know, it's great when things are going good for you. But like, if you're any way vulnerable or, or, you know, feeling a bit down and there's things aren't going your way, it's a really hard place to be. So removing myself from that kind of atmosphere and just removing my exposure to it, I suppose, was a massive coping mechanism for myself. How did you come to the decision to do that? I think from trial and error of like, you know, five injuries and uh, I don't know, just seeing, especially when I missed out on the Tokyo Olympics. Now I do, looking back, hindsight is a great thing. Looking back, I don't think I was ever, I, I don't think I really deserved to qualify for Tokyo. I hadn't gone through enough or understood the significance of qualifying for an Olympics. Like we were all on the same path, but like when I didn't qualify or when I didn't get the chance to go to the qualifiers, I thought it was the world ending. But looking back, I definitely think everything is, you know, in its time. And I don't think that was the right time for me. But going there, when they were all at the Olympics, and I definitely had to come off social media because, you know, when you achieve some people's like childhood dreams of qualifying for the Olympics and seeing everything that goes with that all over social media, it was really tough. So I just had to had to come off. It was a decision I made myself and I've done it now for every injury I've had. And if I'm having a bad day, even I'll sign off and just limit my exposure. And it's been a huge help for me. Right. So you, you've you got the willpower to be able to control when you're on and off. Because uh, like I'd say a lot of people watching will be like, uh, I'd love to do that, but mm. it's, just, uh, uh, it's difficult. It is. It definitely is. But like, it depends on what you're, you choose your difficult. Like it was more difficult for me to be looking at all the things I was missing out on than not seeing any of it. Like I went away, I remember um, for the Worlds last year, I had, you know, kind of I planned in my head that I was getting picked and whatever. Like obviously I didn't take anything for granted. I was <clears throat> I was training away as hard as I could, but I saw myself there. And then obviously when I got injured, I booked a holiday and went away. And I just, I told everyone who was on the holiday with me, like you'll be seeing a lot about the Worlds and everything. So I just don't want to know anything about it. I even think actually Off The Ball had contacted me at the time to do an interview and I just replied saying I'm just not in a good enough headspace to to comment on everything. And I don't know, did that seem like a selfish thing? But individual sport is, is selfish and you have to make decisions that are for your best interest, especially when you're missing out on things because of injury and things like that. You have to look after your own mental health first. And I just would recommend anybody who's struggling with anything because you know social media yourself, it's a world of comparisons and um, a good friend of mine once taught me comparison is the thief of joy and uh, definitely for me I just think when things aren't going great or you're a little bit vulnerable removing yourself from that world of comparing yourself to everyone else's life is a massive thing to to bring forward I think it sounds wise as opposed to selfish to mm. be honest well, thank you. <laughs> well, no, I, I think I think I was one of the people growing you that you're referencing that was in touch with you. I think I, I was just checking there. Like I was in touch with you back in August of 2021. And I remember actually thinking at the time, this this is wise beyond your years in, in in many ways because often sports people are thrust into interviews or social media, and and there's this aspect of life that people don't actually consider for for professional sports people. So for for a, a, a young sports person to to do that and to acknowledge the the things that are maybe not helping. And, and removing them from their lives is actually a really, yeah. really uh, mature thing. Yeah, well, if, if that if that message in itself could reach one person and they might not take the same advice, but consider, like, if you're really aware of what's upsetting you or what's making things harder for you, and then in turn you put in place a plan to, to remove that, you know, it, it just, for me, it really did help. Now, it mightn't help a lot of people, but, like, you know, even yourself with, like, the amount of time that young people spend on their phone. Like, for example, coming up to the elites, I signed off social media for three weeks in the lead up and uh, I read a book, a full book. And I'm not a reader. I know that's not a big thing to a lot of people, but I had so much extra time instead of just picking up my phone and wasting 10, 20 minutes scrolling. I was just picking up my book or something like that. And for me to read a book like is a, is a, a big deal, especially in three weeks. Now, my sister could read three in one day, but... Um, that's an, just another thing that you kind of learn on the job as well and um, yeah I feel like I've matured that's what I mean about I don't think I deserve to qualify for Tokyo at that time because I didn't understand I hadn't gone through enough but I think I've been through the mill and back in the last three years and uh, I feel like I really understand and I've been um, humbled a lot of times so uh, yeah I definitely think that I'm going in the right direction So you are ready for Paris is what, is what we're hearing Yes very much so, yeah. Very much so. Um, yeah, I think Saturday kind of put. I don't know. Like I'm always, I always have a lot of self belief, but I think with everything that happened Saturday and in the way it happened, and like having a career best performance under the circumstances, 
um, a lot of people thought because of the inexperience and the lack of ring time I've had in the last three years might come into play on such a big night with so much at stake. But I um, I just I just believed in myself. And like I said, my family and my team and my coach, Dima, have really believed in me. And I just think the Paris dream is, is more alive now than ever. I've started 2023 in the best way possible. And... Um, leaving the injuries in the past because uh, actually I, I should touch on it um, I never told anyone in the lead up to the elites but four weeks before the competition started I broke my baby toe um, I dropped a 10 kilo dumbbell on it so you actually couldn't Jeez. write the stuff that has happened to me but it's made me 10 times more resilient and uh, yeah thank God everything just worked out so, because uh, famously David Hay broke his toe and had the head beaten off him afterwards and blamed his, his toe. It's obviously important for boxers. It is important for boxers. Um, I didn't even think this was possible, but like I was literally out in the shed. I have a little gym out in the shed out the back here and uh, I had a bit of a sore back. So I was just doing upper body and I was leaving stupidly. I was leaving the weights up on a shelf so not to bend down. And then at the last set, of course, my luck, the thing rolled off and hit my toe. But I went, to, I went to A&E the next day and it was dislocated and broken. So they tried to pull it back into place. Um, no joy. So they actually said, we're going to bring you in on Sunday for surgery. I did not think that was possible, but they put a screw into the top of my toe, which I still actually have in my toe now. Um, and I have to get that removed in about eight weeks. But uh, it got me through the camp, thank God. And uh, fair play to the surgeon and everyone in Tullamore Hospital they were amazing to me and uh, really put me at ease when I thought I was just thinking if I had to pull out of the elites because of a toe injury and not my hand I would have never been able to live with that so uh, yeah I was sparring and all in the lead up to the to the elites with runners on what my right shoe had sewage pipe taped around the toe so that if someone stood on it that it wouldn't it would take some of the impact but worked out and uh, everything went well and uh, I got to where I wanted to be and the toe is fine now so can't right. complain you'll be, you'll be beeping in the air, through the airport anyway with the metal toe heading to Paris <laughs> that's uh, the thing I have, a, I have a metal screw in the toe as well so Jesus I'm like the bionic woman here <laughs> <laughs> well like it's almost like between the, the, the recurrent thumb injury and the toe and the disappointment of Tokyo it's almost like I don't, and I don't, don't want to overstate it, but it is a fairy tale story in some ways to, to to bounce back from all of that and then have the win at the weekend and then look forward to Paris. Yeah, it definitely is in my own head anyway. And everyone is saying to me like, "Oh, how did you get through it all?" And like the sacrifice and the resilience you showed and all. Like, yeah, times were tough, but like I promised myself at the start, like I wasn't going to stop until unless a, a surgeon or someone told me. Um, that I had no future. But I remember it was really traumatizing. After the fourth operation on my thumb, um, the surgeon said to me, like, Granny, look, there's nothing more we can do for you. Now, he was an amazing surgeon up in Belfast. Um, I would not have got through the whole thing without him. Um, but he was like, look, there's not really a whole lot else we can do. Like, we've done everything we possibly can. So, you know, if, if it does keep happening, you're going to have to have a real think about your future. So that was the fourth injury. And then in the lead up to the Europeans there in October, when I broke my hand in the first round, I threw a right hook and I was like, oh my God, I kept going, but I, I knew I was in trouble, but it was a different pain to before because four other operations, I had never actually broke my hand. Um, and then after I, I went, I had to drive up to Belfast to get an x-ray straight away. But the only two things in my head was I'm either going to be fine and get going to the Europeans or I'm going to be retiring and going to college. They were my two. I didn't see any other options. So it was the longest drive ever to Belfast just the worry and everything. And then when I got there, he got, took the x-ray and I was just inconsolably crying. And he was like, um, he said that you've literally broken the only part of your thumb that's not metal. And he's like, I know it sounds like the end of the world, but it's not the end of the road. And that kind of stuck with me. I was, I was obviously devastated because I couldn't go to the Europeans, but at least it wasn't like, he was like, I was expecting to have an hour conversation with you here and I to tell you that you know, you can't fight anymore and that you're going to have to consider some other avenue because if you have problems with your hands as a boxer, you're found out very quickly. So um, I I was, I felt like I kind of had a lucky, you know, a ninth life or whatever or the golden ticket to have one more opportunity. So I'm still on that kind of wave now. I'm on that last opportunity, but I feel like I've left all the injuries in the past and, and the hand is feeling great on the toe as well. Uh, so, Gronja, the process of actually qualifying for the Olympics what's that journey like between here and there 
Um, so the first step on the ladder, I suppose, was Saturday night was uh, making a statement and getting myself back to the number one spot at 66. Um, the weight category just suits me down to the ground as well. I spent the last four years boxing at 69, caught in limbo. But now Amy is kind of in limbo too. Like It's unfortunate because she's won everything at 63, but she used to box at 60 and then she didn't know whether to move up or down. So it's a tough position to be in. <clears throat> um and like, you know, best luck to Amy and everything. I'm sure we'll have many, many a spar and many a contest in the future again. But um, yeah, as I said, we're back to high performance training next week and we'll kind of find out the process for the next few weeks when there'll be assessments, what competitions are coming up. And ultimately the, the high performance team, the coaches will make a decision on who's who's the best at the way and who they want to send to the qualifiers in June. Um, so obviously I'm on a great great run form at the moment so I'm hoping to continue that and uh, stay injury free and just keep my feet on the ground and uh, you know if, if I need to come off social media now and again I definitely will be doing that <laughs> Jeez, uh, Listen to your story Grania it's, it's no surprise that boxers have to do things like reading the book and, and taking the mind off it I know you had been studying um, Italian and German in, in, in Galway for a couple of years and deferred that yeah. and do you still I know you're fairly proficient in speaking Italian do you still keep at that is that another distraction that, that keeps you focused on something outside the ring I'm not going to lie, I should be. And it's always, especially in the last three years when I've been injured, I've enrolled for more courses and like colleges I've gotten in touch with and all because I was like, I never really understood the significance of having a plan B until I was faced with the likes of, you know, you're one punch away, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I don't know, it's so hard when you're training full time. I know, and I know like, People, there is so like you know we have only two sessions a day and there is so much other time but it is really difficult to focus your energy on on other things and meeting deadlines and all that sort of stuff so at the moment I'm kind of still in the process of trying to figure out what my actual passion is like I've um, been working very closely with a, a life skills coach and um, trying to figure out you know what I actually see myself doing after boxing because I kind of did see myself doing you know, primary teaching or one of those secondary teaching with the languages. But I think with the uh, with the the wealth of knowledge I've gained through my own hardship over the last few years, through the ups and downs, I think like I'd love to go on to help other people and may, maybe not just athletes, but like help other people to overcome obstacles. And I don't, I haven't really thought too much about it, but I'm still trying to figure out, you know, where I actually see myself after boxing. But I'm kind of working that out as I go. I've learned so much in the last three years that I couldn't learn in 10 lifetimes so I'd love to be able to use that to help other people as well if that makes sense Yeah it definitely makes sense um, and also you're a brilliant communicator so whatever you end up doing is going to be very interesting comments coming in Dennis Ryan says Offaly must be a county of poets first Michael Verney and now Grania Walsh most impressive OTB continues with a long line of fantastic contributors and great guests lovely to hear stories so the love is pouring in for you <laughs> That's brilliant thanks so much for all the support like it's been unreal since Saturday I'm just thinking like for the last three years, my phone has been virtually silent. And now, like, after the win on Saturday, I'm just not used to, <laughs> you know, the amount of people wishing me well. And, all. like, you know, when you're injured and stuff, they're really the close ones to you see the hardship and, and they're really there for you. But um, it's great to see so much support from not just Offaly. Like, amazing to come from a, from a community like Tullamore and from a county like Offaly. But from all over the country, it's been unreal. So, uh, yeah, hope to continue this run and make everyone proud. Yeah, 100%. Grant, great to have you with us. Thanks a million. Cheers and congratulations. Thanks very much, lads. Appreciate it. Cheers, Thank you. It's uh, our newest boxing superstar, it turns out.